Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Alistair Edgar on the United Nations system. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, the CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. Every week I'm very happy to welcome into the studios here at the Center for International Governance Innovation a uh, noted expert on some aspect of global governance and international public policy. And today I'm happy to welcome my colleague Alistair Edgar, Executive Director of the Academic uh, Council on the United Nations System. Uh, otherwise known as Aikens, yeah. and Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of us uh, at Wilfrid Laurier University. So Pleased to be here. Welcome, uh, Alistair. So we'll talk about the UN system generally and its uh, strengths and weaknesses and what it needs, but we uh, should start perhaps by talking a bit about Aikens, the organization that you direct. Uh, what, what is it? Uh, what's its mandate? How long has it uh, been around? And uh, what is it doing? Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, Aikens is a professional association of scholars and practitioners interested in or working in uh, the United Nations. It's an independent NGO, it's not part of the UN system. Um, so it is the uh, UN studies version of, for example, the American Political Science Association or Canadian Political Science Association. So we have about 700 individual members currently, about 65 institutional members in 60 countries around the world. Um, and the mandate of the Secretariat is uh, twofold, to uh, promote, help and promote uh, s uh, innovative scholarship about the United Nations, about international organizations and global governance. And then secondly, to foster improved dialogue between scholar and practitioner communities uh, for, for their mutual benefit in, in addressing some of these issues. Mm -hmm. And how do you do this? Do you organize workshops, symposia, publications? Wide, wide variety. Um, we have a regular annual meeting that takes place in a different country each year. And in 2000 and, uh, 2012, it was in New York City with the United Nations. 2013, it'll be in Lund University in Sweden. And uh, 2014, in Istanbul, uh, uh, sorry, in Ankara, uh, with Kadir Has University of Turkey. Um, we also then have a meeting every year in Vienna. We're dealing with, um, in cooperation with the various UN technical agencies there. Um, and then we have a training workshop, uh, what we call a summer workshop on international organization studies with about 20 young scholars every year. Um, and then a series of publications, newsletters, podcasts, uh, e-updates that we send out every month. So a wide variety of publications mm -hmm. and then special programs as they arise. Great. So when we talk about the United Nations system, what does that encompass? What's the totality mm -hmm. of the United Nations system as, as well, you understand it? The, the, the UN its secretariat is what most people would normally uh, think of it as, but then also all of the specialized agencies and other bodies around the UN system, uh, related bodies such as the World Bank, the IMF, uh, so we'll deal with uh, finance, trade, uh, economic governance issues. Um, but then we'll also um, talk about the, the range of ideas, if you want, that are represented by the UN. So getting away from specific institutions to ideas about global governance, uh, ideas of democracy or ideas of human rights, uh, or for that matter, ideas of uh, nuclear uh, non-proliferation. And, and some of the challenges around there. So the UN institutional system itself, but also the ideas and values that, that you might say are represented by that system. Mm -hmm. How long has Aikens been around? Uh, we've just celebrated our 25th anniversary. Um, the idea of Aikens precedes that by two or three years, but the actual uh, creation of the organization was 1987. Mm -hmm. And it's been hosted here at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University for uh, how many years now? Since 2003, so almost 10 years now, and it will remain here uh, and for another five-year cycle, so 2013 to 18. Hmm. So hmm. it's because of uh, Canada's uh, value to the UN or the UN's <laughs> value to Canada? Uh, I think it's, it's a very strong bid um, by Wilfrid Laurier University, the senior administration, um, and by uh, other groups. Um, we've had great support in the past from CG and now at the Bolsilly School, of course, here. Um, so a, a very strong bid that, that's um, been better than uh, competitors from around the world. 
Well, we're very happy to be able to host it and to participate. Uh, what are some examples of the projects you're recently involved in at Aikens? What particular kinds of topics are uh, on the agenda? Well, we've just finished um, a workshop recently on uh, maritime piracy in the Horn of Africa, which was uh, a further development of a now three-year-long program uh, on governing maritime piracy issues, which we've been working on with uh, One Earth Future Foundation and the project called Oceans Beyond Piracy. Um, and we're hoping to have uh, another workshop from that, uh, which we will look to hold in Kenya in early next year, uh, to look at uh, the, the issues around uh, children engaged and you know, children uh, trapped in piracy, um, the, the maritime equivalent, if you will, of child soldiers. Uh, which is a, a, a very emotional issue, I suppose, mm. but also a, a very relevant issue that ties into uh, some of Romeo Dallaire's work on child soldiers. So that's one thing that's been going on for a while and, and is continuing. Um, every year with our annual meeting, we have a particular theme and we develop projects around that. So the theme of our 2013 annual meeting is leadership in global governance. Um, and one of the strands in that is uh, looking at uh, the, the legacy of Dag Hammarskjöld and the ideas of leadership embodied in Dag Hammarskjöld. So we're working with the Dag Hammarskjöld Foundation and the Raoul Wallenberg Institute uh, in Lund in Sweden uh, in advance of that. And also um, Margaret Wallström is going to be our keynote speaker there, former Special Rapporteur Secretary General, who's now the uh, Chancellor at uh, Lund University. And we have another plenary session there on women in global governance. Mm. So we're trying to engage uh, with a, certain, a number of world leaders, female world leaders uh, in governments and in international organizations and have some of them come to that meeting as well. So those are the two of, the pro two of our, our current projects that we're just ramping up into. Very good. We'll be back again in a moment with Alistair Edgar. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So as I'm sure you know, uh, in the media and in public discourse in general, the United Nations has in recent years been in for a, a rough ride. Mm -hmm. Its uh, reputation is... Um, not what it used to be, I suppose, in the golden age of liberal internationalism. And I'd like to chat with you about whether that's fair or unfair. But mm -hmm. before we talk about that, maybe we could talk a bit about what's working particularly well in the UN system. We don't hear much commentary about that at all. So mm -hmm. uh, what, what some of the agencies, some of the functions that the United Nations system has yeah. gotten right and, and to what do you attribute its success? Well, um, some of the agencies... Are, it, it, it sounds odd, but some of the agencies work very well because uh, there are big problems in the world, um, which, which makes them, in some senses, sound like they're not working well. But, for example, uh, UN High Commission for Refugees, uh, UN UNICEF, Children's Emergency Fund, um, these agencies are working very well in the field right now in and around Syria, uh, dealing with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees and internally displaced persons, um, registering them as they cross borders, making sure that they've, they've gotten places to stay, that they're in camps, that they're being fed, housed, warded, that there's um, health care being provided to them, etc. Um, those work very well, but they work well when there are crises that have massive numbers of displaced persons. So uh, it's, it's bad situation means good work. Um, the human rights side of the UN, um, I think, has continued, has improved considerably um, and has continued uh, to do much better work, much better reporting in the last three, four, five years. And the Human Rights Council has actually taken action against abuser countries such as Syria, um, which it might not have done 10 years ago uh, and rightly would have been criticized for not taking action against. Um, so some of those things are working very well. Uh, again, peacekeeping, human peacekeeping is as big as or bigger than it ever has been uh, with over 100,000 UN peacekeepers. Now that again means that there's a high demand for UN peacekeepers. The problem with that means that there's large levels of conflict in the world. 
Um, and peacekeeping does not always go well, or it doesn't go as well as one might in a perfect world want it to go. Uh, UN peacekeeping forces in the Congo are struggling right now. Um, but um, nonetheless, the world keeps coming back to the UN to ask for more help with peacekeeping. So there's agencies like that that are doing well. Um, related groups like the, co the uh, Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, CDBTO, um, are doing very good work uh, continuing to support uh, monitoring stations and programs that have offshoots. Um, it's been part of their uh, monitoring programs that help uh, seismic um, monitoring stations around the world for tsunami warnings, uh, events like that. So there's lots of offshoots like that. And you can get into the little, if you want, not little, um, often uh, forgotten areas uh, of uh, meteorological World Health Organization, um, other groups like that, the postal um, management, uh, international civil aviation. A lot of these things are managed through the UN system. And they're not news because they function adequately or well. Uh, therefore, we never hear about them. Mm -hmm. Now, these uh, functional agencies weren't really the initial design intent. Uh, the, the central pillar of the UN was supposed to be the Security Council and, yeah. and the attempt to keep peace between great powers. And mm -hmm. That it hasn't had many opportunities to do what its designers thought it would do. But these mm -hmm. functional agencies, they actually weren't central to the initial blueprint, were they? they not came not at later. all. Yeah, not at all. I mean, you know, the, the, the start of the UN Charter is we the peoples of these United Nations determined to save mankind from the scourge of war. So understandably coming out of the Second World War and if you want out of the First World War and then the Second World War, uh, the focus of the founders was very much uh, peace and security, conflict, prevention, peaceful resolution of disputes. Um, so all these other technical agencies and others, if you want, have grown up in a functional sense. And they've grown up on a basis of demand. The world has become more complex, uh, more um, uh, interconnected, and has needed more governance. And these are forms of governance that have grown up attached to the UN system. Uh, so again, when, you know, as we've grown from 50-something uh, signatory member states to 193 as there's more states and more relationships faster and at different levels um, then the world keeps coming back to and adding on to this thing called the United Nations and the UN system broadly writ. Um, so they keep on adding to it which must mean uh, to some extent that there's value to it although uh, again as you add on ad hoc to organizations and institutions they also become more duplicated, so you end up with more things mm -hmm. uh, running across each other. Mm -hmm. And for example, in the Syria case you described, uh, where both UNICEF and uh, UNHCR are active yeah. in the field, uh, would they work sort of seamlessly hand in glove? Or would they divide responsibility entirely? Mm -hmm. uh, would they be working at cross purposes sometimes? How does the coordination work when more than one agency is involved in a uh, situation? We have a an underfunded and understaffed agency called OCHA, Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, uh, which is meant to address the issues of, of coordinated planning because in a major crisis like that, I mean, the, everything is needed immediately and everywhere. That's unfortunately the way that the crises work. Nothing happens in a nice, neat sequence. Everything mm -hmm. happens at one time. So all of the agencies are needed at one time and there's only one UN budget. Uh, so there is some rivalry, if you want, institutional rivalry and institutional competition. But the UN has had a big program of reform called Delivering as One, uh, which is aimed to, to manage that, to, to at least minimize the degree of overlap or competition and, and help all these organizations to work together. And it's an ongoing process, but it is a, it is a lot better and a lot more effective now than it would have been, again, 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And how does the uh, interface work with uh, other organizations, civil society organizations, other independent NGOs? Is, are they coordinating with the UN in these situations, or are mm -hmm. they sort of independent it, actors in the field? It depends very much on the particular NGO, uh, or for that matter, on particular militaries. Um, I had a discussion recently with a, a senior Canadian military commander who worked in Haiti who said that he and his, his forces worked very, very well with the United Nations there, that the UN people on the ground, the individuals on the ground, 
really knew what they were doing, worked very well with him, and he was very impressed with how they worked. And then I've talked to UN people who've said the same thing about working with military uh, groups, but who've then said, well, a group, let's say, like um, International Red Cross or MSF uh, may want to work completely independently, and that's part of their mandate. So it, it really depends on the NGO or the government body that's there. Um, are they willing? Or do they want to work with the UN? Um, do they want to work independently? The UN obviously can't and won't force others to work with them. Um, but they're able, certainly, to work very well with other groups, and other groups are able to work well with them if they want to. Very good. We'll be back again in a minute with Alistair Edgar. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So let's talk about the part that's not working so well that usually attracts more of the criticism uh, from your perspective. Yeah. Uh, what are the things that the United Nations really needs to work on? Well, um, the, the current uh, hobby horse for everybody who wants to beat on the UN is Syria and the Security Council. Um, and there, um, in, again, there's this image that the Security Council is a united body, is a single body, and therefore if the Security Council wants to do something, then it should do something, and if it can't do it, that means the United Nations is failing in a particular global crisis. Um, but what the critics of the United Nations keep forgetting is that the Security Council is an organization of member states, um, and it can only do what particularly its five most powerful, the permanent five member states, are willing to allow it to do. Um, so the UN Secretariat, if you want, the, the Secretary General, the UN Secretariat in New York, the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, etc., can all be united and have a particular view and have an idea of what needs to be done and, and a very good idea of what needs to be done. But different national governments sitting around the Security Council uh, can stop the UN from being engaged in anything uh, on the basis of their own national interests. Um, China uh, has economic interests, China has political concerns, uh, as does Russia, having looked at what it sees as Western encroachment in uh, Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya, and they look at what's happened there and they're not keen on what they think is possibly the West using the Security Council and the UN as a vehicle to push their own interests into another Middle Eastern country, into Syria. There's all these geopolitical national concerns going on. Now, that's a problem in that that can freeze the UN Security Council from, let's say, authorizing intervention under responsibility to protect. It's not at all clear, though, and I saw Kofi Annan interviewed on this recently, our former Secretary General of the UN. Um, he said it wasn't clear to him if the Russians and Chinese turned around yes tomorrow on the Security Council and said, OK, will go ahead, let's authorize something, what the West would actually want to do, because the West doesn't want to get involved in Syria on the ground, and most Western countries are probably happy to be able to blame Russia and China for not going there. Um, so in, in, a, in a pragmatic sense, not, a, not necessarily a nice sense, the Security Council works very well for all of those countries to stop the world going somewhere where they don't want them to go or they're not willing to go. Um, but for the people in Syria on the ground who are suffering, that kind of geopolitical paralysis, that real politic paralysis in the Security Council uh, is very, very difficult to, to suffer through. And it's easy to criticize the UN on that basis. Does the Secretariat itself have a clear idea of what it would like to see happen in Syria? Uh, well. Um, if you went within a very narrow mandate, yes, they, I mean, Brahimi has been there as the representative, the envoy of, of the Secretary General and the Security Council, uh, and has been trying to negotiate a peace, a ceasefire, a ceasefire to allow the representatives of both parties to negotiate their differences rather than fight over their differences. So that's really you know, what they want. Again, the specialized agencies will have their narrow functional um, jobs and duties and responsibilities uh, to deal with, um, but at the higher political level, 
a ceasefire, uh, end, the con end the fighting there, and find a peaceful negotiated resolution to the conflict, whatever that may be. Or there may not be one. There may not be one, but certainly stop the suffering at this point, and then you, it, one cannot negotiate while in the middle of a war unless you're using the war as a tool for negotiation, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, but uh, they, would, they would like to see that ceasefire. Um, I've just finished talking to a couple of people who are working with Kofi Annan there about, again, the difficulties on the ground, but all of them united around the idea of, of stopping the fighting. Right. Now, a lot of people are saying that the, uh, the existing structure of the Security Council is anachronistic. Mm -hmm. uh, it reflects the world as of the late 1940s. Yeah. needs to be updated. Is this now, in your view, actually a serious problem for the UN? Is it undermining effectiveness or legitimacy? or Legitimacy, I think. Um, I'm not sure if it undermines effectiveness in the sense that um, if you add another five or ten member states, member states have their own political interests. It does not matter whether you are India or South Africa or Brazil or Iran or somebody else. If you're on the Security Council, you bring with you your own national interests. So an enlargement, if you want, of the geographic representation of the Security Council to include more of the rising powers um, and the emerging powers will mean more geopolitical interests and national interest on the Security Council, which could mean more paralysis on the Security Council, not somehow magically more agreement. Mm -hmm. um, the criticism of the Security Council, uh, though that it's not as legitimate because it is not as representative of the new and emerging powers, is a reasonable one. Uh, it is time still to enlarge the Security Council. Um, there are different formulas around for doing that. And then <coughs> to deal with the repercussions of that in terms of the actual effectiveness of the council. Or perhaps change the voting structure at the Security Council and you know, water down the veto or well, there, qualify it in some way. Yeah, there are ideas about qualifying the veto. Um, again, the repercussions of some of that um, may be difficult. Again, uh, how far do you want to push China or Russia or the United States or Britain or France, who, are, who have the veto right now, uh, if major actions are decided upon, agreed upon on the Security Council that go against some of their interests, will they become more obstructive in other areas? Would they even consider withdrawing? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of different things that go along with that. Right. Very good. We'll be back one last time with Alistair Edgar. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So you're right, the Security Council does get most of the <coughs> attention and most mm. of the wrath. Uh, what about the functional agencies? Are there particular ones that are in need of attention that uh, are grossly under-resourced or under-empowered? Uh, most of them, um, most unfortunately. Of them. And um, would you have a, a top five that you would like to see? Yeah, I uh, think so. Um, fixed I mean, somehow. I'd start off with uh, the ones that are engaged in some of the major current crises. So, uh, the uh, UN High Commission for Refugees, uh, the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, UNICEF, UN Women, uh, the ones that are dealing on the ground with a lot of these crises. Um, probably at this point also um, uh, the World Health Organization um, and the Food and Agriculture Organization, the ones that are bringing health and care and, and food to people, food through UNHCR and OHCHR. Um, so they, they, the appeals that they've put out, um, I think the last figures I saw, uh, there was one appeal for food aid for Syria uh, that was asking for $170 million, and they'd received $38 million in pledges. So enormously underfunded. From the member states? From the member states. They cannot provide blankets, they cannot provide food, they cannot provide sufficient tents, any of the, if you want, very basic functional necessities of those refugees and internally displaced persons. Um, so on a crisis, if you want crisis by crisis basis, um, those are the agencies that are severely underfunded, grossly underfunded, and desperately in need of aid. Uh, and then you have, if you want... The but they still do good work. They still, they, they they still, still function. They still function. They do everything they can. Um, and as they say, they go ahead 
and plan and indeed even order on the basis of assuming they'll get the money, but they don't always get the money, but they still have to go ahead and do this. Um, and that then can create backlogs and debts inside of the UN system and needing to move money around in there. Um, so they definitely need it. And then if you want on a, on a longer term basis, um, there are agencies, um, perhaps the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization that needs more political support. Um, there are um, agencies, again, like UN Women that are just starting up that may need more, more funding uh, to mainstream gender issues uh, throughout the UN system. Um, so th those ones, those are not chronic problems in the sense they're not immediate problems. Um, but the UN system generally is, operates on a very slim budget. And uh, again, I couldn't cite for you the exact figures, but you could compare the UN Secretariat's budget to uh, the budget of the fire and police departments of New York City. Mm -hmm. um, so when we think of the UN, uh, you know, we often think of, imagine it as this enormous bureaucracy with, with gazillions of dollars. Um, but in fact, it's a very small bureaucracy. Its agencies are very small. They all operate on very tight budgets. And sometimes they get sliced. UNESCO has just been sliced because of America's uh, displeasure uh, with uh, uh, some of the, the votes that have taken place inside there. Um, so they're, they're also politically very vulnerable. Um, so the UN system itself is, is far smaller than a lot of, of, if you want, conspiracy theorists. Uh, think of it as. Uh, it is far weaker than they would like to portray it as being. Um, and at the same time, uh, I would say it needs to be um, m much more uh, effectively funded uh, and more efficiently funded over time and more consistently funded over time as well so that they can actually plan two or three or four years ahead and not always be worrying about whether they have to move money over here or over here to deal with particular mm -hmm. crises. Are there any structural or organizational reforms that you think would be no-brainers that we should aggressively pursue in the short term? Uh, certainly continuing the delivering as one. Getting, you know, trying to eliminate or manage institutional overlap and institutional um, uh, inefficiencies uh, so that in a particular crisis, for example, one, in one organization takes the lead role and can fold other things into it as it needs to. Um, obviously, the, uh, um, at the political level, the Security Council reforms uh, need to go ahead. But in terms of management reforms, the UN has done a lot in the last 15 to 20 years. It really has changed a lot inside. Much more flexible management, um, still within limits. There are still all the, pol the national political boundaries that are placed around things that happen inside of the UN system. Um, it is not like a, a corporation in the sense that um, you can make decisions and reorganize. There are 193 politically astute, ever watchful stakeholders all guarding their own interests inside of the UN system. That's better than the alternative, which is them pursuing their interests outside of the UN system. But it does build in inefficiencies into the system mm -hmm. itself. And how supportive do you think Canada is right now of the UN system? very unsupportive, if not uh, exactly the opposite, um, highly critical. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, in September when the General Assembly opened, uh, Prime Minister Harper uh, decided that he would not speak. Uh, President Obama spoke uh, to the General Assembly. Other world leaders spoke to the General Assembly. Uh, our Prime Minister uh, decided to send our Foreign Minister John Baird there, uh, and they sent Foreign Minister Baird there to tell the UN off. For, for it being uh, too navel-gazing, too inefficient, for not pursuing the mandates of Canada and countries like Canada. Um, while our Prime Minister took a, an award as Statesman of the Year from a, a foundation and had meetings with, with a few leaders like Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, so Canada has pulled out of peacekeeping. Um, it had pulled out of peacekeeping, begun to say no to peacekeeping operations in previous governments as well, back to Jean Chrétien. Um, so that is not a, a Stephen Harper-driven agenda, although it has been accelerated as Stephen Harper has very much emphasized the war-fighting side, the NATO and the U.S. alliance side of our operations, and almost entirely pulled out of any interest in, in U.N. operations or in the U.N. system more broadly. Do you think that's hurting Canada or no? 
it's, it has hurt Canada uh, in some ways. It certainly hurt its reputation. Uh, friends of Canada, if you want, uh, in the UN system are sad that it's not there and they know it's not there. Um, it costs Canada, I think, um, its world, its reputation around the world. We did not get elected onto the Security Council, although we thought that we would. Uh, and that's the first time that we failed to be elected when we stood for election to the Security Council as a non-permanent member. And that's a statement of what other countries think about Canada's contribution to them. And there is, there is some, some um, cascading effect from that. As we go around the world, if we're looking at partnerships, economic trade, other agreements with countries in Africa, the Middle East or elsewhere, um, the UN system is not separate from them. It is they're there and they will look at what we are or are not doing. And if we're pulling out of political commitments, peacekeeping commitments, other kinds of commitments that cost us in their parts of the world, they will not be as interested in signing agreements with us to our benefit. So it will cost us in some ways. Well, at least Canada can contribute by hosting ACUNS. We so, can uh, indeed. Congratulations yes. on the work you do and thank you for coming in and sharing it with us. And to our audience, thank you for joining us and please join us again next week for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.